Maar mijn nies. Ik zit het in gifts en ik weet niet wat ik Maar ik kan preach. En dat is wat ik hier doen vandaag. Thank you, musicians, for all that you've done for us this morning. Thank you, Elder Dudley, for those kind words. I think somebody ought to say a word of appreciation to you for this camp meeting. Miss, our president planned this in spite of many meetings that surrounded it. Some folk who figured wouldn't anybody come if he called it. He called it, and I guess this is somebody. Uh, Yeah, the other room is full too, so, and another tent full on top of that, so, and folk wandering around the halls because there's nowhere to go, which says something about this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, it has outgrown Oakwood College's facilities, but uh, I hope we never leave here because I love to preach in Elder Ward's church. <laughs> we've, got, we've got air conditioning in here. So, honey, let's enjoy it while we can. Now, today, I want to preach to you on the subject, the best is yet to come. I said, the best is yet to come. Our compound text, uh, that was my suggestion to Elder Earl, and I thank him for doing a good job reading this scripture for me. I gave him two scriptures. One is Hebrews 11. <clears throat> uh, these all died in faith. I'm going right to work. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they say, they that say such things, play, say plainly that they, dig, they seek a country. They're looking for a country. I like verse 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now, nobody ever preached on that to you. I said, nobody's ever preached on that text to you. That's why I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to break the record. It says if they had been mindful. Another translation says if their minds had still been on the country from which they came, God would have given them an opportunity to go on back into slavery. Remember the children of Israel were led out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace of slavery. The Lord said if their minds had remained back where they came from, the Lord would have given them a chance to go back. Which reminds me of some people that I know who spend all their time talking about where they came from. As if they did us a favor to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I got news for you. If you didn't get any better coming here, you ought to go back where you came from. <laughs> Because what we teach will make a man better. But they always, always tell me, well, back where I came from. I used to have a lot of uh, show business personalities uh, to come to my tent meetings. And one of them was so, viv was so vivid in his description of his old lifestyle. I said to him at the end of the meeting, look, don't come back again because you give the impression that you, you, you still love what it was that you used to be doing. Are you listening to me? And I never got him back. I tried, but he wouldn't come back. I thought he'd take my counsel. But ladies and gentlemen, we, We, we must understand that what we came from had to be less than what we came to 
or we'd still be out there. And that's what the verse says. If, if you had been mindful, if your mind was still back where you came from, God will give you a chance to go back where you came from. I've baptized a lot of people, and I like to remind most of them how they were when I found them. And what a great change has taken place in their lives over the years since they were found. Some of y'all had red eyes. You see, 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 scales, you see, I'm sitting up here trying to forget what they were when I found them. Some of them had red, red eyes. I baptized one lady that staggered across the street from my house to my tent. I said, staggered with a can of slits beer in her left hand, a cigarette in the right hand, and staggered. But she got there. Praise the Lord. And she said, I is you the Reverend? <laughs> now, now, don't expect me to rush, honey. Y'all know I take my time. Because I don't care what time you eat. I came to preach, and I'm going to get it all out. I don't preach sermonettes, because sermonettes are for Christianettes. And you know what a Christian Ed is, don't you? He's somebody that can look at TV four hours and can't listen to the preacher one hour. Honey, if you can't listen to me, there's something wrong with your head. So, you know, I've already been judged and declared kosher. So I'm going to say what's on my mind because it took me two weeks to get it together. And I ain't planning to get through under 45 minutes. Are you listening to me now? So that sister, you thought I'd forgotten that. She staggered across the street and she said, is you the Reverend? Now, the, Bi I, the Bible says, agree with your adversary quickly. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm the Reverend. R-E-V-U-N, Reverend. She said, what's going to happen here? I said, I'm going to preach. When you start Sunday night? She said, I'll be here. And that Sunday night, that woman was dressed up, you would not know her, sitting on the front seat, very close to a man, and they listened, and the next night, and the next night, eight solid weeks, things began to drop off of her. I'm talking about where you came from. Now, I can't, I'm not preaching yet, I'm warming the engines. You'll know when I'm preaching. Uh, uh, things began to drop off. Some things she began to leave out. You're not listening. There are things the Bible will take out of you, and there are things the Bible will take off of you. I'm not talking about a church council. I'm talking about the Bible. When you obey the Lord, there are things you're going to leave off. There are things you're going to leave out. And there are places you're going to leave. Now, wait a minute, let's do that one right. And <laughs> do it right. When you obey the Bible, there are things you leave off, there are things you leave out, and there are persons, places, and things that you will leave. So then, so then, don't mess up a testimony meeting talking about where I came from and what I had. We don't care. <laughs> we considered you were fortunate that you're here. Now that's verse 15 that nobody ever preaches on. Uh, what I came to preach on is the pilgrims and the strangers. When Christians forget that they are in transition, they tend to get in trouble in the present environment. I want to say that again. When Christians forget that they are on the way somewhere, 
they begin to dabble and get involved. They tell me that an Indian was traveling east and he crossed the Tennessee River and he liked the way the country looked and he said, Alabama. You know what the word means? We can rest here. Well, for the Christian, there is no Alabama. You are a pilgrim, and you sure had better be a stranger while you're moving through this barren land. Mm -hmm. Verse 15 says, the reason God is not ashamed, did you see that down there? The reason he's not ashamed of a pilgrim is because he forgets where he came from and keeps his mind on where he's going. The Christian is a transient. I don't mean like the transients we know. Transient headed somewhere. And he knows where he's going. He knows what it takes to get there. And he's not going to let anything turn him around. <laughs> We need to quit walking forward, looking backwards. The Lord said, I'm ashamed of those Christians that are walking forward, looking backwards. Mm -hmm. Now, the other text says, that's 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Uh, it says of the children of Issachar, they were men that had an understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. One tells us we're headed somewhere. That's one text. The other tells us we need to understand the times. And we ought to know what we ought to be doing right now. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists understand the times. We are a people of prophecy. In the Adventist church, we talk about Daniel 8, 14. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. First time you heard that, you thought those were 24-hour days. Then somebody read Ezekiel 4, 6. Huh? And Numbers 14, 34. And you found that in prophecy, a day is a year. When you said, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, you didn't know what that meant. But when you got to the Adventist church, you found out that the cleansing of the sanctuary means the judging of the people. You found that out. Then you began to understand the times. 2,300 years, literal years, beginning for. 57 B.C. They ran out in 1844 A.D. Mm -hmm. And in 1844, you discovered that the judgment was set and the books have already been opened. You Adventists understand the times. You know that it is already being determined in heaven who's going to go there. And that that determination has been going on now since 1844 A.D. But only because you understand times. Prophetic time. Uh -huh. There is nothing more pathetic than a people looking forward to something that is already happening. I repeat, there is nothing more pathetic than a people looking forward to something that is already happening. 
but you didn't know it was already happening. Then you joined us, a people that understands the time. You ran into something else too. You ran into Daniel 12, 11. It talks about the 1290 days. You're not sitting in the Adventist church long before you know that you start counting the 1290 days in B.C., pardon me, in A.D. 508. And you put the 1290 to the 508 and that brings out 1798 and you heard a phrase out of the Bible called the time of the end. Daniel 8, 17, the time of the end. Daniel 11, 40, time of the end. Daniel 12, 4, time of the end. And all of a sudden, it occurred to you that all of this stuff we that's, that, who, all this stuff that's running by us is going to end. And that we're living in the time when it can end any time. Amen. You can't tell Israel what to do if you don't understand time. Prophetic time. You wasn't in the Adventist church long before you heard Daniel 12, 12. Blessed and happy is he that waiteth and cometh to the end of the 1335 days. I don't have time for all this arithmetic. I'm headed somewhere. I'm head to, headed to what Israel ought to do. But on the way, I got to salute the time. Just as when Gabriel came down on the resurrection morning. He knew where he was headed. He was headed to a tombstone in Palestine. Where the king of kings and lord of lords was locked up in a hole in the ground. Gabriel knew where he was headed, but on the way, he saluted Octorus, Pleiades, Orion, the North Star, Mars, Jupiter. <laughs> Are y'all still here? Am I in here enjoying myself by myself? Well, don't worry about it. I can do, I'm capable of doing that. <laughs> I'm having a ball. Gabriel knew where he was headed. But he saluted Orion. Y'all know where I am? Saluted Octorus, Pleiades, huh? Saluted the North Star. Aimed like a homing pigeon toward a hole in the ground in Palestine where the creator of heaven and earth had been for two and a half days. He hit the ground, and there wasn't no runway. The Bible said it was a great earthquake. Which means that Gabriel didn't have his flaps down. Some of these folks have never flown, they don't know what I'm talking about. Gabriel didn't let the flaps down. Shout it, come forth, thou son of God, thy father calleth thee. Gabriel knew where he was going. Gabriel knew what he was doing. But on the way, he had to pass all these, these landmarks. I'm on the way to telling you what Israel ought to do. But I can't tell you what Israel ought to do until we understand the times in which we are living. There can be no business as usual now. The 2300 days are past. And you are living on borrowed time. Unscheduled time. There's nothing in the Bible about these times. Only events. There shall be wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes. That's not time. That's not when. That's not when, that's what? We've done run out of when. In 1844, Revelation 10, 6, Franklin Hill, doesn't it say that an angel came down, put a foot on land, put a foot on sea, raised the 
raised his hand to heaven. There shall be time no longer. Prophetic time ran out. You are living on manufactured time. Somebody ought to understand these things. We understand them. Well, that's prophetic time. We know something about probationary time. That's different. This is time char characterized by catastrophic events. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I'm still not preaching. I'm on the way to the sermon. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I keep wanting to tr preach, but I keep holding back here because I got to have something on the end. I'm, I'm, I'm old. I can't fire all the way through no more. All right, shut up and listen. Matthew 24, 3. What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus ticks off events. 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 Wars, famine, earthquake, pestilences. Men shall be covered as proud, blasphemous, and boasters. First Timothy 3, 1. Last days. First John 2, 18. Last times. Matthew 24, 14, then shall the end come. I am not whistling in the dark. You are living in the end. You are down in the feet of the great image of Daniel chapter 2. You know, we got some, got some, uh, some so-called theologians, even in our church, that uh, tell you that uh, every generation since Christ went back to heaven was supposed to believe that they are in, living in the end. That's a scholarly position. That's so that you can never tie them down to any, any thing like soon. It can't tie him down to a word like quickly. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. And they say, how quickly, how quick is quickly. And I tell them, look, I don't know the day or the hour, but I know the times. I know the times. Adventists have always known some about the times. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. And I'm no fool, I know what nigh is. And if I didn't know what nigh is, I could look at nuclear proliferation. See, I teach in the college, so I must use a few collegiate terms. I know what multiplied bombs are. That's nuclear proliferation. I know what the danger on the streets and kids going around with submachine guns. I know what that is. I know somebody ought to be singing, I feel like my time ain't long. I know what a drug dealer is, and I know they're killing our kids, and I know that if life goes on like it is, the quality of life has so deteriorated, talk to them, believe it, the nature of life has so deteriorated that I wouldn't need any prophecy to tell me that this mess can't last long. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. And I'm going home to live with God. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger. Now I'm preaching. I've got you down where I want you now. What Israel ought to do. That's what I want to talk about. Right now, let me tell you what you ought to be doing back where you came from. I, I only have two things. Number one, we need to enter the kingdom of grace. 
There are a lot of kingdoms down here. But there's one every one of us ought to be getting into right now. We call it the kingdom of grace. Isaiah put it like this in 55, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. There's probationary time in there. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. I'm telling you what we ought to be doing now. In the light of the times, let the wicked forsake his ways. Nobody needs to tell you what's wicked. If you didn't have a Bible, you know what's wicked. Because God put a little, little, a little time piece in your head. So that whenever you go wrong, the, 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 the trigger uh, flips. And you feel like a puppy. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Indicating that the time will come when he will not be found. Probation. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Drop that other woman. Pour that liquor in the creek. Oh, no, don't put it there. The fish may get drunk. <laughs> I start to say pour it on the ground, but then the poor ants. I better pour it in the toilet. Oh, 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 oh. Well, pour it, but don't pour it in the air. Where you say? Let the wicked one say his way. The unrighteous man is stuck. You better watch your thinking. God, your mind. Don't sit up there and look at everything on TV just because it's on TV. Cut it off. And if nobody, if they won't let you cut it off, throw it out. <laughs> Somebody asked me what's the difference in having a TV and going to the movie. Answer, you can control, control your TV. Can't control the movie. But some of y'all can't even control the TV. So then you ain't got no better with TV. Are you listening to me? Knowing the time. You better watch your thoughts. Porn pornography. The inversion of values. Where homosexuality is now being advertised as an alternate lifestyle. You need to know the time. This world is gone. They installed, they installed uh, these little dispensing machines. What do they call them? The, you know, one of these little machines you can put money in it, push them. What do they call them? Uh-uh. All right, since you know what it is, let's go home. They install one of these little machines at the University of Minnesota. Guess what they were dispensing? Condoms. Men have given up on the Ten Commandments and are now trying to manage the disaster. Thank God for the Adventist Church. We've always taught that the solution to the abortion issue is stay out of bed. You have some people get ready back there. Let's see you say your name. Come on. Yeah, let's get practice up because you got to get out there with me. Listen, man, there's no safe. <laughs> the only safe single sex is no sex. Forty-seven years on six continents, I've been telling it, and every time a new disease pops up, one reason I am quit running meetings, AIDS showed up. And when AIDS hit, I said, back to the corner. I now have some aid. There are more people that have been converted into keeping the seventh commandment since AIDS hit them. What the word won't do, AIDS will. I 
said, man, no time for me to quit now. I'm getting some help. <laughs> Dear, look, Elder Dudley can tell you. I told him, I told him three years ago, no more tents. Didn't I? No more tents. I'm tired. Gun got old. Ma'am, <laughs> I got to reading what's going on out there. The Surgeon General preaching Adventist sermons on tobacco. I said, this ain't no time to quit. I'm getting some help from the government now. I need to go to Washington and make a call. Maybe they'll join up there. I'm preaching now. We Adventists know something else too. We not only know that these are the last days, but we know that men ought to be seeking the Lord while he may be found. But you know, I started to pass over this, but I want to sneak this in because it's down here. We not only know something about prophetic time, we know about what we call celebrative time. Write that down, celebrative time. We Adventists celebrate creation and we celebrate redemption. We call it creative time, uh, celebrative time, where once a week we come together on the day that the Bible tells you to come together. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I just want to point out that we Adventists know the times. We know we know prophetic time. We know celebrative time. Once a week, seventh day of the week, a day called Saturday, we come together to celebrate creation so that we'll never get mixed up with evolution. And we come and celebrate redemption so that we will never su succumb to the error that some do in thinking that they can work their way to glory. Every time we keep a Sabbath, we celebrate the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which can alone cleanse us from our sins. We acknowledge God creator. We acknowledge him creator, <laughs> redeemer, celebrative time. Now back. What should Israel do? Seek the Lord. Call upon him. The blind man said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus converted him. This is how you enter the kingdom of grace. He converted him. Conversion is the fine tuning of the mind of man with the mind of God by the Holy Spirit. We need more converted people in this room. I mean, in these rooms, that other building's full too. The uh, breaking of the old synaptic connections in the brain, breaking habits that are rooted in, in usage and, and re repetition. I did it once, I did it twice, I did it again and again, and now I can't quit doing it. Whether it be taking cocaine, or smoking marijuana, or I'm addicted to a man, if I'm a lady, to a lady, if I'm a man, I just can't get it, as one young man said, I can't get it out of my head. I said, but he can get it out of your head. He said, he who? I said, the one that died for you. His blood can cleanse the brain and remove any evidence, any residual inclinations, the blood can empower, the blood can cleanse, the blood can purge, what can wash away my sins? None but the blood. And it'll never lose its power. When we get converted, the Lord instills within us fresh appetites. It'll give a husband an appetite for his own wife. 
it'll cool a young single man's appetite for his girlfriend at the proper moment. But <laughs> somebody said socialism will put a new coat on a man. I answer, Christ will put a new man in the coat. <laughs> if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things ought to be passing away. You get out and pray, thy kingdom come. Right after that, you pray, thy will be done. When the kingdom comes, the will gets done. Uh, don't sit up there like you deserve that same act. When the kingdom comes, the will gets done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It doesn't do any good to do the will outside the kingdom. There's some good, there's some sinners that don't run around on their wives. But they're still going to hell because they're sinners. They ought to be born again for the good deeds to count. If your name isn't on the roll, God can't give you a grade. <laughs> giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us <laughs> who, has, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness hath translated us into the kingdom of his son so whom through whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin what do we ought to be doing now? Embrace Christ as Savior. Acknowledge him as Lord. Obey him as sovereign. Serve him as master. Trust him as a friend. Follow him as leader. Exalt him as God. Accept him as sacrifice. Revere him as father. Love him as brother. Proclaim him king of kings and lord of lords. And he will be to you a way maker a sin shaker, an elevator, you're a dead house. He'll be a way maker, a sin shaker, an elevator, an emancipator, a heart fixer, and a love elixir, an undertaker, and a habit breaker, a faith feeder, and a joy breeder, a heart mender, a holy ghost sender, a grave robber, and a safe harbor. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now the second thing you ought to be doing, and this is all. First thing is, enter the kingdom of grace. Do that now. Don't wait till later and cut out that prayer you pray. And save us when thou comest in thy kingdom. Too late. Too late. When he comes in his kingdom, he said, let not child be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to a place for you. If I go, I'll come again and receive you. He didn't say, I'll come again and save you. He got to save you now to receive you then. Now's the time to get saved. Now's the time to get into the kingdom of grace. That's the first one. Now the second and the last one. Head for the kingdom of glory. Remember, you're a pilgrim and you're a stranger. A fugitive is a man running away from home. A vagabond is a man that has no home. A strange stranger is already away from home. But a pilgrim is on the way home. And the Bible says you're a pilgrim. You're on the way home. The Greek word for pilgrim means you're an alien down here. It says alien alongside. And then for stranger, you got xenos, meaning a foreigner, an alien alongside the world. Not in it, alongside it. Not a part of it, alongside it. Hmm. An American embassy explains it better. An American embassy, if you've ever been in a foreign land, is a little spot of America in a foreign land. 
Inside that building, the laws of America apply, even though the embassy is in India. We celebrate Christmas, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July. On the walls are the pictures of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. An embassy is a little spot of America set down in a foreign land. Hmm. The Christian is a little bit of heaven set down on the earth. I don't care who the president of the country is. Christ is the Christian's king. The Ten Commandments are the laws of the kingdom. And our hearts are his throne. And my life is his territory. And there are three pictures that hang on the wall of my soul. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In here, we celebrate creation and redemption. The Sabbath is a day on which we do it. We are pilgrims. We didn't come here for the stay. Aliens alongside and in transient. Within the framework of Hebrews 11, the pilgrim is an expectant tent dweller. He is a transient of sorts in search of a permanent settlement. That's why you can't get too fixed down here. You're on the way somewhere. So there was hope of a fixed house in a movable tent in Abraham's day. He was careful not to become a part of the lifestyle of the inhabitants that surrounded him. You're not listening. You're not listening. He was an alien alongside in the world, but not of it. Like a ship in the sea, but not of the sea. When the ship becomes of the sea, it hits the bottom. Marshall Kelly and I visited Sydney, Australia, 1971. We were hosted at a reception in City Hall in that mainly Caucasian country. The mayor and his underage appeared. The mayor with his Masonic sash and all of his degrees proudly displayed. And the mayor had plenty of liquor, plenty of alcohol spread all around the place. But he'd heard about these two pilgrims. He had heard about these two aliens alongside. We, long, we are alongside the alcohol, but never a part of it, and it was never a part of us. And he knew that, so alongside the alcohol, he had plenty of unspiked lemonade. So while the natives partook of the stronger substance, Brother Kelly and I walked around with clearer heads, drinking our good old Adventist lemonade. Uh, they knew uh, that we followed the biblical lifestyle. You're not listening. They had researched us, and they knew that we were aliens to the norm. You don't serve pilgrims, but you serve the natives. Because we don't eat like them, we don't drink like them, we don't dress like them, we don't act like them. We're pilgrims and strangers. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. That word conformed, the Greek word means to fashion yourself according to. This dichotomy between the Christian and the social order has always made trouble for the Christians. It got Daniel thrown into a lion's den because he was just different at all, that's all. He didn't eat like the Babylonians. He didn't drink like them. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. He didn't eat like them. He didn't drink like them. He didn't dress like them. He didn't act like them. So here he is, headed to the lion's den. But Daniel said, that's all right. I didn't come here to stay no how. I'm a pilgrim. 
I'm a stranger and I'm traveling through this barren land. <laughs> he was sustained by the knowledge that he was on his way somewhere anyhow and to kill him would only speed him out of his misery. The misery of just being here. Are you listening to me? So Daniel also knew that if they should, if the lion should tear him limb from limb, <laughs> the day would come when the life giver's voice would be heard and bone would come together with bone. Uh, this uh, dichotomy between Christians and the social order is what got Joseph thrown into part of his dungeon. But Joseph said, okay, if I die in this hole in the ground, and one day the voice of the life giver will be heard, bone will come together with bone. This dichotomy between uh, the Christian and the social order got Shadrach thrown into the fiery furnace. Shadrach said, all right, didn't come here to stay anyhow. If the flames reduce me to ashes, one day I'll hear the voice of the life giver and bone will come together with bone. This dichotomy between the Christian and the social order got Paul's neck cut off on Nero's chopping block. But Paul said, that's all right. I didn't come to stay anyhow. And if they separate my head from my body, that's all right. One day, I'll hear the voice of the life giver. And bone will come together with bone. Toe bone will connect with the foot bone. Foot bone's going to hook with the ankle. Ankle with the leg and the leg with the knee. Knee with the thigh and the thigh with the hip. Hip bone connected with the back. Back with the shoulder. Shoulder with the neck. Neck with the head. And I'm going to stand up in my flesh and see God. It was this dichotomy between the Christian order and the social order that landed Jesus on Mount Golgotha. Oh, but hanging up there, Jesus knew he didn't come here to stay either. <laughs> Are you listening to me? He knew he was coming out of here. So he said, go ahead, drive the nails in my hand. Laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead, say it in me. The day will come. <laughs> And you will see, I'm going to rise again, and ain't no power on earth going to keep me down. Be ye transformed, be ye metamorphosized, be ye transfigured. The Greek word there is in the present imperative, I tell you in conclusion. It is a command to do something in the future that involves continuous or repeated action. Our transformation is continuous. Our transformation is repeated. You don't become an angel overnight. Be patient with yourselves and just metamorphosize. Just change. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I like that, I like that, I like that. Now, in conclusion, the objective of our pilgrimage is the city. Hebrews 11:10. he looked for a city. Verse 16, but now they desire a better city. That is a heavenly one. Hebrews 12, 22, you come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Revelation 21, 2, I, John, saw the city, the new Jerusalem. Hebrews 13, 14, for here we have no continuing city. We seek one to come. The Christian is on his way to the city. He is in transition. Poverty can't discourage me. I'm headed somewhere. Riches can't blind me. I'm headed somewhere. Sickness can't frighten me. I'm headed somewhere. Betrayal can't weaken me. I'm headed somewhere. Gossip, gossip and backbiting can't destroy me. I'm headed somewhere. Desertion can't confuse me. I'm headed somewhere. Death can't stop me. I'm headed somewhere. If you don't go, don't hinder me. I'm on my way to Canaan land. Ain't nothing you can do turn me around. I'm on my way to Canaan land. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger traveling through this barren land. I got a home in yonder city and it's not great God made by human hand. Thursday morning, Thursday morning, Sister Mamie Clemens called me from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania early in the morning. A nephew who was a good boy had just died. Brother Kelly, you all come on. And uh, 
He's a good boy. The mourners were around the bed weeping. Little boy was almost gone. Suddenly he sat up and he smiled. He stopped dying and sat up and smiled and said, cheer up everybody. The best is yet to come. And then he laid down and passed away. Laid down and passed away. Oh boy, thank God Abraham understood that boy. He could look past the loneliness of leaving his home. He could look past the desertion of his neighbor, his nephew Lot. He could look past the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He could look past his own feelings when he lied to Abimelech. He could look for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Little girl was headed home and uh, she had to go through the cemetery. Somebody said, little girl, said, uh, aren't you scared to go through that cemetery? She said, no. They said, why? She said, well, sir, my home is just on the other side. <laughs> Dr. Morrison, in conclusion, Dr. Morrison visited Africa at the same time that President Teddy Roosevelt visited Africa. Dr. Morrison led 10,000 souls to Christ while he was in Africa. 10,000. President Roosevelt shot a few buffalo and a few hogs and returned to America. They both came back same time. Waiting to meet the president. Oh, what a reception. The mayor, the governor, the bands playing, flags waving. Thousands thronged the way to greet him. President of the United States, 21 gun salute. Poor Dr. Morrison, the preacher, slipped unnoticed from the boat with not even a relative there to meet him. No flags, no bands, no 21-gun salutes. He felt a bit sad. When suddenly it dawned on him, I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere behind them. The angels beckon me. I don't need no 21 gun salute. The angels beckon me. I don't need any waving flags or cheering crowds. The angels beckon me. Uh, I like it. I'm looking for a city with streets of gold, gates of pearl. Walls of Jephthah. When I get home, somebody's gonna shout, Open ye the gates. <laughs> no, no. Open ye, <laughs> ye the gates of the city, that the righteous nation that keepeth the truth shall enter in. The angels beckoned me, and he felt better already. On the way home, he said, King Jesus will lead the grand march to the city. So who needs a 21-gun salute? The righteous of all ages are with that glittering revenue, a retinue, are with that glittering retinue of marchers. <sighs> Sons and daughters of earth they are, but by that time, corruptible would have put on incorruption, and mortal would have put on immortality. Listen to this. And our lungs will be equipped to handle the troposphere, the stratosphere, the ionosphere, the exosphere, and the celestosphere. Don't look up that last one. I made it up. Are you listening? I'm closing. Are you listening? And so, this mighty army of Christian soldiers led by Jesus is, will be nearing home. Soon the city will come into view. The city that Abraham looked for. The city that John saw. The city that has fired our dreams and quickened our heartbeats. Hastening our footsteps toward its gilded glory. The new Jerusalem gleaming like a crown jewel against the limitless infinity of outer space. Who help us, Lord? It will come into view, and someone in our crowd will crowd. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, 
Be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Somebody on the inside shouts back, Who is this King of glory? Our man shouts back, The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts. He is this King of glory. Mysteriously, 12 giant pearls will swing inside on their hinges and the saints go marching in. It's decision time. It's decision time. We're getting ready to stand in a minute and we're getting ready to sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. And while we're singing, I'm going to make an invitation, and I want you to understand it. First of all, I'm going to be calling those who used to be good Christians, but the enemy sowed some weeds in your garden, and you got away from the Lord, and you've been sitting here right now listening to the Holy Ghost deal with your brain, and you want to come home. It's cold out there. It's not what you thought it would be, and you want to come on back. When we stand and I come down there, don't wait for me to beg you. Come on out of there. Come down. Give Lord your heart. Give me your hand. But I'm going to be talking to somebody else too. Same time. You come, come with them. There's somebody sitting here that belongs to another denomination. Your body is over there, but your head is in here. That's why you are in here. You believe what we believe. You've believed it a long time. Maybe you didn't have the courage to do it. Maybe this just wasn't your time to do it. But this morning, when we stand up and sing, I want you to head down here. Give the Lord your heart, me your hand. You're going to move into the Christian faith, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and go to the kingdom of God with us. I want you to come down. Thirdly, there's some people out there who never gave their hearts to the Lord. And you're... That emptiness has been there all these years. But right now, you want to remedy the situation. You want Christ in you, the hope of glory. You want Christ and all of the benefits of the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. You want it in your heart because you haven't lived very well and things haven't gone well. And there is an emptiness there that Christ alone can fill. When we stand to sing, pass me not. I want you to come down here. Give me your hand. Give God your heart. Stand, everybody. Sing it. Pass me not, O gentle Pass Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Empty these seats if you can. Do Come on. not pass me. Man, woman, boy, or girl. Come on, hold. Sing it, Savior. Sing it. Come on. Savior. God bless you, brother. Come right on. Come on. Savior. Yes. Come on. Savior. God bless you. Have a seat. Sing it. Play in your hearts. Come on. My heart. Come on, else. Give it a room. I'll leave it. Have to, but come on now, now, all the way. All right, sister. Bless your heart. Have a seat right there. God bless you. Come on. Please. Always God's hand. You want to come home? Come on. Me. Like to become an activist for the first time. Come on. Do it now. Next song. Next stand. Let me at the throne. Me at somebody else. Throne of mercy. Somebody else. Spirit of God, pleading with you. Come out. The sweet. Come out. Come out. Yes. Yes. Out of the balcony. Come on. Healing there. If you're in the other building, come on. Yeah. Bless you. Come on. 
Helps us, help us. Oh, yes, that's it. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Billy. Hang on. Savior. Savior. I'm Savior. Come on. Just a moment. Let me tell you something. You know, 